do you keep the existing campaigns and maybe run it for a couple of years or do you create new campaigns? Hello, I'm your host, John Cavendish, and welcome to season three of the Amazon Strategist Show. The show is all strategy with no hacks, no silver bullets, and no magic pills, just real practical strategies to sort your Amazon business. So today, we have the pleasure of being joined by Mike Danford. Mike is Chief Strategy Officer at Adverio, who most commonly partner with brands with over a thousand SKUs. So we're going to be talking about large catalogs today, which I'm super excited about, and it's a real differentiator for you know what we talk about on this show so i love that when he's not fighting in the trenches he is working out so that he can eat <laughs> and anyone who knows him knows that he is more than happy being surrounded by water surfing jet skiing uh, handstanding whatever that may be um <laughs> we'll get into that later as well so awesome welcome to the show mike thanks john glad to be here um cool well great to have you here i know we talked previously when we connected about your journey but could you tell us a little bit about how you ended up where you are right now in the amazon space Sure. Yeah, I started back in 2014, 2015, went through the uh, ASM, amazing selling machine, if, you, if you've been in the space for that long, and uh, launched my own product, had my own brand, and then started doing some retail arbitrage, et cetera. And I realized that one of my most expensive um, hires was around PPC and advertising. And I was like, hey, this is numbers. I like numbers. Let's see if I can figure this out. Uh, so I did, and then started sharing those in groups, and others were like, hey, could you do it for me, and we'll pay you. And obviously, the rest is history from there. And then, you know, kind of niched into large catalogs, having started an apparel brand, and just kind of started working with other apparel brands, and uh, the uniqueness that comes with large catalogs, and have kind of stuck to it since then. Awesome, cool. So I was also ASM. I did ASM4 back in 20, was that 14, 15, when everyone thought it was too late, and that we'd missed the boat from the 2012 people who got into ASM1 and were making loads of money back at the time. So it's just hilarious. Cool, so you got into larger catalogs and how did that morph from you being a seller to you starting a, a service? Yeah, so as a seller, we had uh, a supplement brand in the beginning and then started having some graphic tees and you know, uh, funny fitness saying shirts, et cetera. I went more D2C on my own website. So for Shopify was, was popular and, and common, right? Um, and then I started doing retail arbitrage and ironically, timing, uh, was reselling Nike, um, shoes. Yeah. So we go to their outlets and pick up, you know, hundreds to thousands of their shoes and just managing the inventory out of my small home at the time but... <laughs> was a challenge and then learning just, you know, how do you keep up with the inventory? How does it work? Um, et cetera. And then I started to realize that, you know, the more SKUs, the more inventory, the more options you have, the less. Uh, critical if you have returns or thinner margins on a, on a pair of shoes or you, you bought the wrong style or you promoted something that didn't work or, and your margins weren't, weren't as favorable. If you had more and more and more products, you would have more home runs to go off of. So just understood that. And then I was, I can communicate with that understanding, having that background personally and on the advertising space, you know, it has definitely changed since 2012, 14 and, and on the back end of Amazon with ads, had a lot more options. Um, and there are some, some pretty unique ways to go about high multivariant catalogs um, across the board, even with catalog management, case management, et cetera. So um, that's been the journey. I love it. That's super cool. And yeah, we all find our little niches, don't we? So, you know, we all find into a little part. And you're like, yes, I like that bit. I'll do that for, uh, and then it, somehow it becomes like a, a career in whatever, whatever it may be. Um, we'll talk about a bit later, which is, you know, how do you find experts in those specific areas? But before we get into that, with large scale catalogs, like how do you actually keep your finger on and the pulse of what's going on across all of these SKUs? Sure. Well, that's a great choice of words there. We actually developed a, a profit pulse system or the PPS that we have. Um, and we actually built that system. It's a free tool um, that we can give you a plug to at the end of the, the sep episode here. Um, and it just shows a priority. It helps you understand, you know, your ABC groupings and where they are in terms of, you can look at ROI, margin, ad sales, total sales, there's lots of different ways you can look at it. And we brought on a brand about two or three months ago with I think around 15,000 SKUs. And you know, of course the Pareto, the top 250 or so kind of carry the, the majority of the weight of the sales. And they come in and our assessment was, there's probably not much more juice to, to squeeze from these top 250. Uh, so let's go and look at the, the B tier and let's, and that's what we've been pushing for the last uh, month and a half or so. Um, and that tier is growing and, and that's that PPS, that pulse system we talked about helps us understand that and say, Hey, um, 
your advertising is a lot lower relative to your organic or total sales. So you can push your, or, Hey, you are dumping a lot of cash into a very mature product. Stop doing that. You don't need to, or where else can we, can we redistribute that, that spend, et cetera. Um, and you go across and you can look at conversion rate from ad conversion versus listing conversion, total listing conversion rate to understand that the ads are actually helping the listing or hurting the listing. There's so much that you can have. And it's, it's a constant battle. You know, it's, we have to build AI and machine learning into it to help us, you know, not get too near, uh, nearsighted or, or narrow, um, focus on a few products. And, and, and what we've come to find out is, Hey, the, the brand has neglected these SKUs at the very bottom of their catalog. And we usually can throw a little spaghetti on the wall and a few things will stick. And Hey, all of a sudden we've got one going up the ranks and like, Hey, we haven't sold this SKU in five years. How are you selling it as like a number 10 SKU right now? And it's, it's just. The, the platform changes, um, the, the chopper personas change, the, the market changes, et cetera. So if it didn't work five years ago, sometimes it'll work more now or better now than it did. Um, so definitely circling back to that. Um, and then, you know, it's just going through and we have a ton of scores and other metrics so from a listing quality score to uh, how problematic is this SKU and how many cases it has. Is this SKU worth uh, keeping because it's costing you more in time and trying to fight Amazon and they want to keep you know, messing up your category nodes, et cetera. So look at the case history, uh, reviews, et cetera. So it's, it's a lot, um, but pulling it all together and, and to your point, keeping that pulse, it's it's always changing, always changing. Mm. That's interesting. And when you talk about like SKUs that are performing or going up, are you looking at them just on the account because you've got so many SKUs or are you actually pulling data from the market to figure out where they fit in the current marketplace? Because it's such a high volume. No. Yeah, for most brands, it's you don't really need to get out into the market until they get into your A tier, which is where they're doing really well and they're already selling well. And is it worth, is the juice worth the squeeze to start being more and more granular and pulling in the extra competitor data? Or nine times out of 10, it is more cost effective for the brand, for us, and faster to just push what you have and see what will work and get it to its natural um, state of you know balance as opposed to trying to ink out an extra quarter percent of conversion rate or click through rate and just kind of get that little incremental lift. Um, now, once you've had that and you've kind of, you know, maybe doubled the number of ASINs from 250 to 500 that are now carrying the majority of the weight, then you can go back and do that. Um, but most of the time it's just chasing your tail when you're doing that. And, and, and it's fun. Uh, yes, we do optimize the top SKUs. If this is a glaring issue of, Hey, you've got a bunch of negative reviews. Let's work on getting those, uh, removed or pulling out an old variant that's kind of pulling down your score. Um, hey, your pricing. So that's another thing we've, over the last six months, we've really started to pushing dynamic pricing optimization. And that has been a lot of fun. Uh, we have SKUs that uh, maybe a low cost SKU, you know, eight or $9 where advertising is really expensive. It's already really? in the top, maybe 10 or 15 BSR for a subcategory node. Um, and just, you want to keep it there. So we've started doing pricing optimization and deal optimization. Um, you know, Amazon charges a flat fee for the deals pretty it's pretty incredible we have tons of case studies on that internally that we're working on um to where hey don't have to, it's, it's a cost per acquisition model as opposed to a cost per click model um we're seeing that with influencer marketing and affiliate marketing and everything as well it's like you don't have to pay until you've actually sold um which is it's helpful as the the cpc space gets a little more uh, busy uh, yeah totally agree on that with pricing optimization um, are you using like it? How are you doing that? Using an external tool, internal tools? Is that a secret? How, how are you doing yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. There's a few. So we have two competitors. We're, we're putting them head to head right now. Um, they don't Wait. know about the other, but it is what it is. Um, and and one is a lot more visibility for us as more of a, a managed service, and the other is but, more. Uh, I'm sorry, of a self service, and then the other is a managed service. Um, different approaches, and it's pretty in, in, impressive to be able to pull your competitor data. And say, hey, if you increase your price by this much or decrease your price by this much, this is what the velocity will change. And it can kind of give you your profit projections based on the last 365 days of uh, sales. Um, obviously, with Prime Day coming up, not sure when this episode will release, but around Prime Day, you can do intraday pricing optimization based on traffic uh, coming to it. Uh, if you're getting a lot more traffic, you can start generally push the price up. Obviously, try to see how the conversion is. If the conversion fails, and you can pull the price down. So you can squeeze more and more juice in real time around high traffic events. And there's, that's just one option. There's liquidation, there's BSR protection. I mean, there's all kinds of tactics that can come in. Oh, that's super cool. I didn't realize you could do that intraday. So, I mean, that's awesome for profitability on Prime Day. Well, we could do a whole episode about that. But, 
Yeah. That's really, really cool. When it comes to your service, uh, what do you focus on the most um, to, you know, to increase your clients' uh, profitability, sales? Like what do they, what do they want to come to you? What do they want when they come to you? Sure. It's what's well, different. Everyone basically comes to us generally because they have, you know, they want to fix a listing issue uh, or that they're advertising. They're not sure if they're advertising the correct amount and ways, et cetera, or shiny object syndrome. We're like, I want DSP. We're like, Hey, let's check and see if your sponsored ads are actually mm. working and you're leveraging that as much. Uh, and then you have listing optimization, update my images, update my copy, et cetera. And they all have this. Um, no one really comes to us for pricing optimizations. So that's really our uphill battle of, hey, when's the last time you changed your prices? That's ah, been two years or a year ago. And you're like, okay, how many times are your competitors? So we'll pull a competitor up and say, look at their pricing. It's changed over time. When you think you're firing my sales down, look, the competitor's price is $2 lower. There's yeah. your reason. It's not your ads, it's other stuff. It's a holistic approach. Um, that being said, it is difficult with map pricing, especially on the channel, as we mentioned at the beginning of the, um, the episode here, that you have to be careful with the following and not losing your buy box and, and making sure it syncs across the listings, uh, across your platforms, et cetera, especially if you're using like a Saucify or a channel advisor or some kind of uh, omni-channel uh, manager. Um, and that's, that's definitely a challenge, but uh, I would say that's a lot of brands just need to do more of the basics. They, they've been in the space for 10 or 15 years. They're a nice mid, low seven figure brand. And they're like, hey, we're not growing anymore. Uh, why is that? And then, like I mentioned, we'll go in like, hey, let's go get some ASIN you haven't touched in a few years. Let's also look at this. Look at your product opportunity explorer. Look at these other tools that are available inside of Amazon that tells you where you're relative to your competitors and, and what they're saying about your competitors versus yours and what your rank is or why is this particular design outranking us? Um, there's there's so much information that Amazon is giving sellers more and more of. Um, however, it's a lot of information. It's not the most pretty. It's very complicated. Sometimes don't, you can't even export it or you're limited inside. So right. we aim to, every time they release something, um, typically on the front end before, the API is always usually later, um, but we, we work to build as many Google suite tools, docs, sheets, et cetera. Um, and then we give those out for free once we build them because we know it helps us and it helps others to understand what to look, look for and use this data and visualize it. Um, so it's, it's, it's a constant process for sure. Cool. And like when you talk about omnichannel tools, do a lot of your clients come to you already using omnichannel tools or how does that usually work? Yeah, most of them do. Um, we'll have a few that'll come in, maybe they're doing D2C and they want to get on Amazon or one marketplace or they're on Amazon, they want to get on the Walmart. Um, yeah. But most of them, because they have such a large catalog, they need some kind of PIM down multi-product or high product um, management tool. Uh, so they're already on those and it's pretty easy to distribute it across other channels just because most of them have integrations. Mm. Cool. So well, maybe we'll move that into the subject type of, into the episode title. Cause I feel like, you know, that's a very big thing that a lot of people, you know, it's a good classifier. Like you need to be of a certain size or a certain skew count to want to use one of those tools. Cause as you said, they can be a real pain. Yeah. As well as a pleasure, as well as a benefit. Yeah, there, there's one or two that I've just mentioned there that uh, you're, you're spending more time fixing the issues of the the platform. That we talked about that before as well. Me. It's like, yeah, you're fighting the machine, right? So it's 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 what's the lesser of two evils, right? Hundred mm. percent. I mean, how do you decide, or when you were a seller and you were thinking about using service providers, like how did you decide whether to do it in house or to use a service provider for different parts of your business? It's, it's, it's reducing the learning curve. So it's, how do you want to learn? Do you actually want to learn this? Is your team large enough? Most of brands that work with, again, mid to seven, mid eight figure brands, they have it and they can have the talent inside. But what they come to realize is that even though if you're a Google or a Shopify or an Amazon expert, it's really hard to transfer that across to another um, marketplace or vertical or sales channel, et cetera. So that's one part. And then the other is, you know, most people that are internal have maybe worked for one or two brands and they only see a few things, whereas an agency like us, where we see hundreds and thousands of brands, we get to see, pull all that data together. Um, and you can answer questions a lot faster, say, hey, no, don't, don't do this. We've already done that. We've already followed the shiny object. Like I mentioned, any new feature that's released or report comes from Amazon, we're on it. We're trying to understand, can you leverage it? How do you leverage it? Does it make sense? Um, a new ad type comes out. Does it make sense to do that? What's going on? We get to have that macro lens. Um, I do think that you do need to have, you know, typically a seven figure seller before you pull into an agency. I think it's just really cost uh, prohibitive to do that. I think you need to understand the brand and understand the marketplace. You need to learn that, whether it's you or just, you know, a right hand man or woman. 
um, to do that before you get in. And then once you think you're in your seven figures, it does help to to speed up that curve to to pull in, um, you know, an agency or a different service provider, someone that specifically has experience. Typically, in your vertical, that's definitely helpful as well because what what works in one vertical does not work to the other or niche, etc. Um, and then what you get, you know, working with an agency that's, that's large enough is a, a bench, right? So say if someone goes out on vacation, like we just had, we had one of our director of operations go out last week, we were able to pull another brand manager in to assist with that. Or we have someone that's an expert in a specific type of category or vertical who can come in and tap. And then, you know, we have weekly meetings. There's three weekly meetings across the different teams that will say, Hey, here's what I'm seeing on this type of account. Are you seeing this as well? Or how did you do this? Or, Hey, what? We have 30 minutes every session. You have to you have to have a problem or an issue or a concern, and you, and you have to ask. Uh, the team chimes in, and it just reduces that learning curve um, for sure. And then, I mean, there, obviously I'm biased. I want to be agency first, but I, I do try to be respectful of that when we have prospects come to us and say, hey, we do tell them, you're not ready um, for us. One, cost, it's not cost effective for you. And two, you need to do a few things in the back end. You need to understand a little more about you know what Amazon is, what the features are. You know, we, it's really difficult for us to educate or train a, a brand up that's fairly new um, because we can't talk about Product Opportunity Explorer or these catalog tools and these other things because they don't have the basic knowledge. Um, that's just not what we're here for. So we usually point them into a direction where someone that works more with a go-to-market brand and can give them that education or point them to an education uh, resource for sure. Cool. Yeah, I'd agree with that as well. I mean, I think what we did create with Seller Candy is like a stepping stone. So some people do come to us when they're earlier on because we are a more cost-effective service then you can come out and use us until you get ready for a yep. full service solution such as yourself or depending yeah. on what what type of service you need for Absolutely. what area which is where we I like to I be fully endorse that remark too yes <laughs> <laughs> thank you all right so we have another section of the podcast that we're going to go into we have our controversial take don't know why we call it controversial take i think americans would call it hot take um <laughs> But uh, yeah, so what is your most desi- uh, debatable, not desirable, debatable or controversial opinion related to the Amazon or the e-commerce industry in general? Oh man, it's, it's, it's of the week. So we just had one I actually spoke about yesterday and there's a lot of chatter since I've been in the space about um, with the advertising specifically, do you keep the existing campaigns and maybe running for a couple of years or do you create new campaigns? And we've been with a brand for a little over four and a half years, and we've done as much as we can to retain the original campaigns from four or five years ago. A few things happen. One, the old campaigns don't have the new feature, so you have to create new campaigns sometimes, so you're kind of forced to do that. Uh, and the second is, yes, there is disruption when you take and, and harvest or move successful targets or whatever from one campaign to a new campaign. Uh, but we just did this uh, across you know, a six-figure spending brand It takes about two weeks and then it comes right back to where it was in terms of traffic, efficiency, um, and and velocity as well. Um, So obviously you don't want to do that all at once. There are some software platforms out there, especially in the advertising space that require all new campaigns. But uh, I think most of them are starting to switch more to at least a campaign takeover. So you can kind of migrate and and, and stare that out. But it is a debate. Um, Previously, I was, you know, hey, let's create new campaigns. Let's just suck it up for that week or two. Um, but now we're starting to figure out how to do more of a hybrid approach and how to how to reduce that um, disruption. That's great. I mean, one to two weeks isn't actually that bad either. I mean, I've heard in the past it taking a while to get the same kind of traction. Just clarification on that then. Would you create both campaigns run them simultaneously? Do you turn one off and take a hit? How do, how do you usually do that transfer? That's a great question. So what we've come to find out is the best thing is is just to to pause the source immediately once you create it. You're going to mirror the bids. You're going to mirror all the placement settings, as many placement settings as you can. But you're going to increase the bids about 40 to 50% higher than what the bid was in the existing campaign. And then every few days, you're going to taper it back down to where the bid was. Um, If you don't do that boost in the beginning, you don't get the traction. It may take three or four days before it even gets the traction, even though it has the same bid, the same everything, the same placement. Uh, that's because that campaign doesn't have that validity and that signal to Amazon saying this is a this is a good term. So you do have to bid higher. Um, yeah. Does not necessarily mean that your CPC is going to be higher, but it does mean you have to bid higher to get recognition for the keyword. We found that out. Um, so that's been that's been our take on it, um, and we're we're working harder to make it where it's only a three to four day transition. So we're trying to figure that out. 
Cool. I love it. That's really useful, actionable information. And um, yeah, that's what I really like about this episode. We've gone into super technical stuff that only be, only be applicable to a small amount of the audience. And, you know, it's great that we do that because they're the people that we want to add value to with higher SKU count catalogs. So it's really cool. All right. I mean, that's basically it for the episode. So if you got a lot of value out of this episode and you want to connect with Mike, uh, Mike, what's the best way for people to reach out to you and Adverio? Sure, yeah. Uh, so we put together a little kit for, for folks here. It's adverio.io forward slash uh, Amazon strategist. It's our, our eight-figure toolkit. Um, as I mentioned multiple times, we've built a ton of tools. You have access to this. You have free access to it, and we update it regularly. Um, any new tool that comes out will be in there. It's a live Google Doc link that you have access to. Definitely recommend that. Obviously, you can find us on our website or LinkedIn, et cetera. Oh, perfect. So yeah, go check out, download that toolkit. I checked out already. looks excellent. And um, thank you for watching the show. So if you're watching us on whatever platform, please go like, subscribe, uh, or mainly just click the like button because it makes us appear higher in the rankings when people search for Amazon and Amazon Show. So thanks so much for being here, Mike, and talk to you again soon. Thanks, Sean.